I opened my eyes to a dark blur of confusion. My shoulder hurt a pain shooting through it. Something lay like a weight on me. I could not seem to move my left arm. Then I moved it and it hurt. I was lying twisted. I sat up. And with a rush, memory came. The crash was over. I was not dead. Anita. She was lying beside me. There was a little light here in the silent blur, a soft mellow earthlight filtering in the window. The weight on me was Anita. She lay sprawled, her head and shoulders halfway across my lap. Not dead. Thank God, not dead. She moved. Her arms went around me, and I lifted her. The earthlight glowed on her pale face. It's past, Anita. We've struck, and we're still alive. I held her as though all of life's turgid dangers were powerless to touch us. But in the silence my floating senses were brought back to reality by a faint sound forcing itself upon me. A little hiss. The faintest murmuring breath like a hiss. Escaping air. I cast off Anita's clinging arms. Anita, this is madness. For minutes we must have been lying there in the heaven of our embrace. But air was escaping. The planetara's dome was broken and our precious air was hissing out. Full reality came to me. I was not seriously injured. I found I could move freely. I could stand. A twisted shoulder, a limp left arm, but they were better in a moment. And Anita did not seem to be hurt. Blood was upon her. But not her own. Beside Anita, stretched face down on the turret grid, was the giant figure of Miko. The blood lay in a small pool against his face. A widening pool. Moa was here. I thought her body twitched, then was still. This soundless wreckage. In the dim glow of the wrecked turret with its two motionless, broken human figures, it seemed as though Anita and I were ghouls prowling. I saw that the turret had fallen over to the planetara's deck. It lay dashed against the dome side. The deck was aslant. A litter of wreckage. A broken human figure showed one of the crew who, at the last, must have come running up. The forward observation tower was down on the chart room roof, in its metal tangle I thought I could see the legs of the tower lookout. So this was the end of the brigand's adventure. The planetara's last voyage. How small and futile are human struggles. Miko's daring enterprise, so villainous, brought all in a few moments to this silent tragedy. The plane Terra had fallen 30,000 miles. But why? What had happened to Han? And where was Coniston, down in this broken hull? And Snap. I thought suddenly of Snap. I clutched at my wandering wits. This inactivity was death. The escaping air hissed in my ears. Our precious air, escaping away into the vacant desolation of the lunar emptiness. Through one of the twisted, slanting dome windows a rocky spire was visible. The plain terra lay bow down, wedged in a jagged cradle of lunar rock. A miracle that the hull and dome had held together. Anita, we must get out of here. Their helmets are in the forward storage room, Greg. She was staring at the fallen Nico and Moa. She shuddered and turned away and gripped me. In the forward storage room, by the port of the emergency exit. If only the exit locks would operate. We must find Snap and get out of here. Good old Snap. Would we find him lying dead? We climbed from the slanting, fallen turret, over the wreckage of the littered deck. It was not difficult. 
a lightness was upon us. The planetara's gravity magnetizers were dead, this was only the light moon gravity pulling us. Careful, Anita. Don't jump too freely. We leaped along the deck. The hiss of the escaping pressure was like a clanging gong of warning to tell us to hurry. The hiss of death so close. Snap, I murmured. Oh, Greg, I pray we may find him alive. With a 15-foot leap we cleared a pile of broken deck chairs. A man lay groaning near them. I went back with a rush. Not Snap. A steward. He had been a brigand, but he was a steward to me now. Get up. This is Haljan. Hurry, we must get out of here the air is escaping. But he sank back and lay still. No time to find if I could help him, there was Anita and Snap to save. We found a broken entrance to one of the descending passages. I flung the debris aside and cleared it. Like a giant of strength with only this moon gravity holding me, I raised a broken segment of superstructure and heaved it back. Anita and I dropped ourselves down the sloping passage. The interior of the wrecked ship was silent and dim. An occasional passage light was still burning. The passage in all the rooms lay askew. Wreckage everywhere but the double dome and hull shell had withstood the shock. Then I realized that the Arendt system was slowing down. Our heat, like our air, was escaping, radiating away, a deadly chill settling on everything. The silence and the deadly chill of death would soon be here in these wrecked corridors. The end of the plain terra. We prowled like ghouls. We did not see Coniston. Snap had been by the shifter pumps. We found him in the oval doorway. He lay sprawled. Dead? No, he moved. He sat up before we could get to him. He seemed confused, but his senses clarified with the movement of our figures over him. Greg. Why, Anita? Snap. You're all right? We struck, the air is escaping. He pushed me away. He tried to stand. I'm all right. I was up a minute ago. Greg, it's getting cold. Where is she? I had her here, she wasn't killed. I spoke to her. Irrational. Snap. I held him. Shook him. Snap, old fellow. He said normally, easy, Greg. I'm all right. Anita gripped him. Who, snap. She, there she is. Another figure was here. On the grid floor by the door oval. A figure partly shrouded in a broken invisible cloak and hook. An invisible cloak. I saw a white face with opened eyes regarding me. Venza. I bent down. You. Venza here? Why, how, my thoughts swept on. Venza here, dying? Her eyes closed. But she murmured to Anita. Where is he? I want him. I murmured impulsively, Here I am, Venza dear. Gently, as one would speak with gentle sympathy to humor the dying. Here I am, Venza. But it was only the confusion of the shock upon her. And it was upon us all. She pushed at Anita. I want him. She saw me, this whimsical Venus girl. Even here as we gathered, all of us blurred by shock, confused in the dim, wrecked ship with the chill of death coming, even here she could jest. Her pale lips smiled. You, Greg. 
I'm not hurt, I don't think I'm hurt. She managed to get herself up on one elbow. Did you think I wanted you with my dying breath? What conceit? Not you, handsome Haljan. I was calling Snap. He was down to her. We're all right, Venza. It's over. We must get out of the ship. The air is escaping. We gathered in the oval doorway. We fought the confusion of panic. The exit port is this way. Or was it? I answered Snap, yes, I think so. The ship suddenly seemed a stranger to me. So cold. So vibrationless. Broken lights. These slanting wrecked corridors. With the ventilating fan stilled, the air was turning fetid. Chilling. And thinning, with escaping pressure, rarefying so that I could feel the grasp of it in my lungs and the pinpricks in my cheeks. We started off. Four of us, still alive in this silent ship of death. My blurred thoughts tried to cope with it all. Venza here. I remembered how she had bade me create a diversion when the women passengers were landing on the asteroid. She had carried out her purpose. In the confusion she had not gone ashore. A stowaway here. She had secured the cloak. Prowling, to try, and help us, she had come upon Han. Had seized his ray cylinder and struck him down, and been herself knocked unconscious by his dying lunge, which also had broken the tubes and wrecked the plane Terra. And Venza, unconscious, had been lying here with the mechanism of her cloak still operating, so that we did not see her when we came and found why Han did not answer my signals. It's here, Greg. Snap and I lifted the pile of moon equipment to which she referred. We located four suits and helmets and the mechanisms to operate them. More are in the chart room, Anita said. But we needed no others. I robed Anita and showed her the mechanisms. Snap was helping Venza. We were all stiff from the cold, but within the suits and their pulsing currents, the blessed warmth came again. The helmets had ports through which food and drink could be taken. I stood with my helmet ready. Anita, Venza and Snap were bloated and grotesque beside me. We had found food and water here, assembled in portable cases which the brigands had prepared. Snap lifted them, and signaled to me he was ready. My helmet shut out all sounds save my own breathing, my pounding heart, and the murmur of the mechanism. The warmth and pure air were good. We reached the hull port locks. They operated. We went through in the light of the headlamps over our foreheads. I closed the locks after us, an instinct to keep the air in the ship for the other trapped humans lying in there. We slid down the sloping side of the plane Terra. We were unweighted, irrationally agile with this slight gravity. I fell a dozen feet and landed with barely a jar. We were out on the lunar surface. A great sloping ramp of crags stretched down before us. Gray-black rock tinged with earthlight. The earth hung amid the stars in the blackness overhead like a huge section of a glowing yellow ball. This grim, desolate, silent landscape. Beyond the ramp, fifty feet below us, a tumbled naked plain stretched away into blurred distance. But I could see mountains off there. Behind us, the towering, frowning rampart wall of Archimedes loomed against the sky. I had turned to look back at the plain Terra. She lay broken, wedged between spires of upstanding rock. A few of her lights still gleamed. The End of the Plain Terra The three grotesque figures of Anita, Venza, and Snap had started off. Hunchback figures with the tanks mounted on their shoulders. I bounded and caught them. I touched Snap. 
We made Audi phone contact. Which way do you think? I demanded. I think this way, down the ramp. Away from Archimedes, toward the mountains. It shouldn't be too far. You run with Venza. I'll hold Anita. He nodded. But we must keep together, Greg. We could soon run freely. Down the ramp, out over the tumbled plain. Bounding, grotesque, leaping strides. The girls were more agile, more skillful. They were soon leading us. The earth shadows of their figures leaped beside them. The plain terra faded into the distance behind us. Archimedes stood back there. Ahead, the mountains came closer. An hour, perhaps. I lost track of time. Occasionally we stopped to rest. Were we going toward the Grantline camp? Would they see our tiny waving headlights? Another interval. Then far ahead of us on the ragged plain, light showed. Moving, tiny spots of light. Headlights on helmeted figures. We ran, monstrously leaping. A group of figures were off there. Grantline's party? Snap gripped me. Grantline. We're safe, Greg. Safe. He took his bulb light from his helmet. We stood in a group while he waved it. A semaphore signal. Grantline? And the answer came, yes. You, Dean? Their personal code. No doubt of this, it was Grantline, who had seen the plane Terra fall and had come to help us. I stood then with my hand holding Anita. And I whispered, it's Grantline. We're safe, Anita, my darling. Death had been so close. Those horrible last minutes on the plane Terra had shocked us, marked us. We stood trembling. And Grantline and his men came bounding up, weird, inflated figures. A helmeted figure touched me. I saw through the helmet pane the visage of a stern-faced, square-jawed young man. Grantline? Johnny Grantline? Yes, said his voice at my ear grid. I'm Grantline. You're Haljan? Greg Haljan? They crowded around us. Gripped us to hear our explanations. Brigands! It was amazing to Johnny Grantline. But the menace was over now, over as soon as Grantline realized its existence. We stood for a brief time discussing it. Then I drew apart, leaving Snap with Grantline. And Anita joined me. I held her arm so that we had Audi phone contact. Anita, mine. Greg, dear one. Murmured nothings which mean so much to lovers. As we stood in the fantastic bloom of lunar desolation, with the blessed earthlight on us, I sent up a prayer of thankfulness. Not that the enormous treasure was saved. Not that the attack upon Grantline had been averted. But only that Anita was given back to me. In moments of greatest emotion the human mind individualizes. To me, there was only Anita. Life is very strange. The gate to the shining garden of our love seemed swinging wide to let us in. Yet I recall that a vague fear still lay on me. A premonition? I felt a touch on my arm. A bloated helmet visor was thrust near my own. I saw Snap's face peering at me. Grantline thinks we should return to the Plain Terra. Might find some of them alive. Grantline touched me. It's only human. 
Yes, I said. We went back. Some ten of us, a line of grotesque figures bounding with slow, easy strides over the jagged, rock strewn plain. Our lights danced before us. The plane Terra came at last into view. My ship. Again that pang swept me as I saw her. This, her last resting place. She lay here, in her open tomb, shattered, broken, unbreathing. The lights on her were extinguished. The Arendt system had ceased to pulse the heart of the dying ship, for a while beating faintly, but now at rest. We left the two girls with some of Grantline's men at the admission port. Snap, Grantline and I, with three others, went inside. There still seemed to be air, but not enough so that we dared remove our helmets. It was dark inside the wrecked ship. The corridors were black. The hall control rooms were dimly with earthlight straggling through the windows. This littered tomb. Cold and silent with death. We stumbled over a fallen figure. A member of the crew. Grantline straightened from examining it. Dead, he said. Earthlight fell on the horrible face. Puffed flesh bloated red from the blood which had oozed from its pores in the thinning air. I looked away. We prowled further. Han lay dead in the pump room. The body of Coniston should have been near here. We did not see it. We climbed up to the slanting, littered deck. The air up here had all almost hissed away. Again Grantline touched me. That the turret? No wonder he asked me. The wreckage was all so formless. Yes. We climbed after Snap into the broken turret room. We passed the body of that steward who just at the end had appealed to me and I had left dying. The legs of the forward lookout still poked grotesquely up from the wreckage of the observatory tower where it lay smashed down against the roof of the chart room. We shoved ourselves into the turret. What was this? No bodies here. The giant Miko was gone. The pool of blood lay congealed into a frozen dark splotch on the metal grid. And Moa was gone. They had not been dead. Had dragged themselves out of here, fighting desperately for life. We would find them somewhere around here. But we did not. Nor Coniston. I recalled what Anita had said, other suits and helmets had been here in the nearby chart room. The brigands had taken them, and food and water doubtless, and escaped from the ship following us through the lower admission ports only a few minutes after we were gone. We made careful search of the entire ship. Eight of the bodies which should have been here were missing, Miko, Moa, Coniston, and five of the crew. We did not find them outside. They were hiding near here, no doubt, more willing to take their chances than to yield to us now. But how, in all this lunar desolation, could we hope to locate them? No use, said Grantline. Let them go. If they want death, well, they deserve it. But we were saved. Then, as I stood there, realization leaped at me. Saved? Were we not indeed fatuous fools? In all these emotion-swept moments since we had encountered Grantline, Memory of that brigand ship coming from Mars had never once occurred to Snap and me. I told Grantline now. He stared at me. What? I told him again. It would be here in eight days. Fully manned and armed. But Haljan, we have almost no weapons. All my comet space was taken with equipment and the mechanisms for my camp. I can't signal Earth. I was depending on the plane Terra. It surged upon us. 
the brigand menace passed? We were blindly congratulating ourselves on our safety. But it would be eight days or more before in distant Farakshan the non-arrival of the plane Terra would cause any real comment. No one was searching for us, no one was worried over us. No wonder the crafty Nico was willing to take his chances out here in the lunar wilds. His ship, his reinforcements, his weapons were coming rapidly. And we were helpless. Almost unarmed. Marooned here on the moon. <laughs>